I want to welcome you back to another episode of the In the Blood podcast. Each week I try to explore relationship with self, relationship with others, and how the two bounce off of each other. Now, this week's going to be a bit of a different conversation. Jason and I did have something recorded, which I was going to release today, but current events in the United States have gotten me to the point where I just feel like I have to say something. And that conversation that him and I had, that can stew for another week. What I have to say right now, I don't think it can. Now, I made my first podcast appearance back in 2009. Anybody who's been following me for any portion of that knows that I don't like talking about politics. I don't like talking about politics because this is one of those areas where everybody's already dug into their point of view and they're not really interested in hearing what any differing view has to say. Now, I, I know that the conversation about politics, it, it needs to happen. We should all be thinking about the things that affect us. We should be thinking about the things that affect our neighbors, our loved ones. We should be having discussions with each other, like grown-ups, trying to figure out a way forward that benefits the most number of people as possible, right? What's going to affect the most positive outcome on all of society the the problem is and especially with um the u.s election coming up in november there's been so much drama surrounding that and like god the, the claws are out on every side of this conversation you know and i'm not gonna really get into what my side of things is i mean i'm canadian i don't have a vote in that country anyways And maybe some of you are going to want to disregard my opinion just based on the fact that you don't think I got a horse in the race. But the thing is, I do. I got a lot of friends who live in the U.S. A lot of people I care about a great deal are living there. One of my sons has got dual citizenship between Canada and the U.S. He plans to attend college in the U.S. I really have like a strong interest in what's happening down there just based on my son alone. Okay. That should be enough to justify me having a strongly held opinion. That being said, I am going to reserve my position. I'm going to reserve sharing my opinion on who, if anybody, I think is the best candidate. I want to focus instead on the conversation. I want to focus on the relationships that are being affected amongst my American friends while they try to decide how to approach the ballot box this November. You know, I've, I've often said that we have more in common than we have in conflict. And on the surface, I think most people can, can, can understand that. They can see it. The, the problem is when we start getting into the realm of like really, really hot button issues, especially those surrounding federal politics, that turns into a yeah, but situation. Yeah, I, I understand. We do have more in common than we have in conflict, but. And you know what? There is no but. We need to stop looking at the world in terms of us versus them. We need to stop looking at people and thinking, well, I can't believe you're a Democrat. I can't believe you're a Republican. I can't believe you're third party X, whatever. Why don't we start looking at like, why is it that we can't get along? And I'm not saying, why can't we agree? I'm saying, why can't we get along? Knowing that we've got all this stuff in common and so very very little in conflict why is it getting to the point where on some level it just it feels like there would be some people that wouldn't be surprised or even disappointed if a civil war broke out at this point i mean holy crap people is it necessary to get to this point you know why can't we get along there's a there's a real easy question right there We can't get along because we've dug into our position. Why have we dug into our position? We dig into our position because we feel that our well-being is at risk. When our well-being is at risk, I don't know. I, 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 
I'm not a psychologist, so I can't say for sure, but I would wager a pretty healthy guess that our human survival instinct kicks in and says, hey, my well-being is at risk. I don't like this. Now is the time to get aggressive. Now is the time to identify everything that matters to me. The problem is, is that the people that disagree with us, they're approaching the same issues as we are. They also want to protect their well-being. It just, the, the thing is, is that they're perceiving different risks to their well-being maybe than we are. Or maybe they perceive the same threats to our well-being, but they see different approaches to the problems, different approaches to the threats as being more beneficial than the ones that maybe we would choose. Hey, before I get too deep in, this is something that's become kind of a habit on the show the last couple of weeks. I want to Googleize what the definition of well-being is. Okay, so according to Oxford Dictionary, well-being is defined as, quote, the state of being comfortable, healthy, or happy, end quote. Okay, so right there, you can see well-being. I mean, that's painted with a very broad brush. Well-being affects every imaginable part of our lives, okay? If we feel that our well-being is being threatened, you can see how maybe for the outsider looking in, they can see one issue that we really seem hung up on, but it's not that we're hung up on this one issue because that one issue is worth the entirety of our focus, attention, and worth our, our voice screaming at the top of its lungs. It's because this one issue that we get stuck on represents a broader scope of, of things. It represents a way of life. It represents not just our well-being, but our entire way of being. And when we start thinking in, in, in personal terms like this, start thinking about, okay, why is it that I get so hot when I'm approaching this conversation about politics? Do you think maybe there's a clue in there as far as where the opposition might be coming from? We don't like being dismissed as being less than or being stupid. They don't either. Yet here we are, both sides, assuming there's only two sides. But both sides, every every side, I guess, all looking at the other side, thinking, wow, you guys got it wrong. You guys are idiots. Why can't you join us? We're the smart ones. What the hell is wrong with you? You know, we, we, we see the, uh, the, the liberals condescending to the conservatives. Wow. You're, you're evil. You're stupid. I can't believe blah, blah, blah. The conservatives looking at the liberals, dismissing them as libtards, making stupid comments. Everybody's clenching their teeth and bawling their fists. And they got this big freaking hate on for each other. And why do we even stop to think about what the hell are we fighting about? Beyond that, what are we fighting for? Do we think about that? What are the actual issues? Okay. And yeah, it's really easy to say, okay, well, the issues are there's a threat to our democracy. Well, no shit. You think I can't see that? I see that very, very well. And regardless of which side of the political spectrum I find myself on, I see democracy is at risk. Anytime my guy doesn't win, I've got a lot of room to feel slighted. The other sides of the conversation, they feel the same way. If their guy doesn't win, of course, they're going to feel slighted. It's not just this general concept of democracy that we're fighting for. What we're fighting for is, 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 is for our voice to be heard, for our voice to actually carry some weight. We want our position to matter. Because our position is tied into our well-being. Our well-being is tied into the people we love the most. Of course, the claws are going to come out. Is this really so difficult to figure out? But I want to hone in a little bit on like some of the... Maybe, maybe try to clearly define what the actual threats to our well-being are. You know, the, the things that maybe will help us see the other side a little bit, maybe help us have more productive conversations. 
maybe even if we're lucky, we can sit down with somebody and being armed with a clear idea of what it is we're actually getting heated about, maybe, just maybe, we can change some minds. We can sway the outcome to one that benefits everybody. So I, I jotted down a, a few things, and hopefully they make sense. But I mean, the, the first thing I jotted down was we're, we're all looking at wanting freedom. And you'd think that on, on, on the surface, I mean, this seems like, okay, well, of course, you know, like freedom, justice, liberty for all, you know, however it's phrased in, in, in the States. The one thing I think that most people can agree on is that they want to maintain their freedom. Okay. Now, the reason I think we disagree on this concept of freedom is there are those camps where the, the, I think the one end of the spectrum is like people want freedom to be able to do things safely, right? Yes, we want to be free, but at the same time, if we need to sacrifice some personal freedom in order for the greater good, well, then we're happy to make that sacrifice. The other end of the spectrum, they want just freedom to do things without restriction. Screw the greater good. As soon as I start concerning myself with the greater good, as soon as you start trying to get me to give up my freedoms, I see that as a slippery slope and that's not one I want to get on. Okay. So whichever end of the spectrum you're on, think about that. Think about what, where you're at, what you're actually saying. Think about where the other person is coming from. Maybe with that little bit of understanding of like where they're standing, you can sort of figure out like how to have a conversation that doesn't end with us pointing at each other and calling names. There's people who want to see lower taxes, right? Which makes sense. I mean, if you're concerned about your well-being, I mean, having more dollars in your pocket would certainly contribute to your well-being. But then there's the other end of the spectrum where people don't mind paying a little bit of higher taxes if it means that we're going to end up with higher quality infrastructure and or um, better quality social uh, safety nets, medical care. I don't know, just any number of things that are funded by tax dollars. And people don't mind paying a little bit into that because it's just they see that as a way to improve their well-being. Like, OK, yeah, a few extra bucks in my pocket is nice. But so is being able to go to see the doctor without having to pay like an exorbitant amount of money. You know, both ends of this spectrum are reasonable, like it or not. I really do think that they're both reasonable. So again, instead of like digging in and lobbing insults at each other, why not just have a conversation, a debate, see if we can figure out maybe, you know, if you think that we need to have more stuff that, that's paid for by tax dollars, maybe approach the person who wants lower taxes with some hard numbers and say, look, you're really concerned the taxes are going up and you know, as a catchphrase, that's really terrifying. But the reality is you'd only be paying like an extra 60 bucks a year. Is that really going to kill you? And I think in a lot of cases, you might find that these people that get really, really stuck on the lower taxes thing, they might realize that, oh, I didn't realize it was actually going to be so affordable. That being said, the, the conversation works both ways. I mean, if somebody who wants lower taxes is approaching somebody who wants all the extra programs, they say, look, like it's, it's really nice. I agree with you. We should have access to all these things, but this is how much it's going to cost you per year. Maybe you've got it in your head that it's going to be cheap and affordable, but the reality is this is going to be thousands upon thousands of dollars over the tax year and you're barely scraping by as it is. Maybe you can't afford these things that you say you want as much as they sound good on paper. Now, I'm not saying who's right, who's wrong. I'm just saying that there are different ways to, to look at this and we need to be receptive to these different ways. There's people that see progress as a threat to well-being. On the other side, there's people that see embracing tradition too strongly as a threat to well-being. You know, do I need to really go into detail on this? I think we understand the concepts at play here. Is there a way that we can honor each other while approaching this conversation? Look, we're not taking a dump on these traditions that you value, but do you think maybe we can scale them back rather than us celebrating your traditions on a society-wide scale? 
maybe it would be more appropriate for you to embrace these traditions, customs, rituals, whatever the case may be in your household, in your social club, in your house of worship, in your, you know, whatever is appropriate. We're not saying you're not allowed to have your traditions. We're just saying that we, we, we can't prioritize them to the point where they hinder progress. Likewise, if you're pushing for too much progress too quickly to the point where you actually are saying, you know what? I don't care about your traditions. I only care that we move forward. Can you understand why you might meet some pushback on that? Is it possible that it's not just the other person being a jerk? That maybe they're just reacting in a completely justifiable way to you pushing too damn hard? A little bit of conversation. I mean, that's where the understanding comes from. And I don't like this whole idea of saying, well, you know, education is the answer. As though I need to educate you or you need to educate me. There's something so condescending about that. I don't want to educate anybody. I want to engage in dialogue. Maybe I'm wrong. I'm open to that. Are you? If you want them to be open to the idea that they may be wrong, maybe don't make it so difficult for them. Respect the fact that they've got ideas about things. You don't have to agree with them. You don't even have to respect the ideas. Just like at least have enough decency to like hear them out. And I think you'll find that more often than not, if you let somebody say their piece, they're going to become infinitely more likely to, to give you room for the same. Yeah, another thing that gets us all like really, really heated is when we get into these situations where we're dealing with, we feel like we have a really, really good understanding of the facts and whoever opposes us must be misunderstanding the facts. They must be misinformed. They must be conspiracy theorists. They must be wrong. They must be idiots, right? Because after all, we've done our research. Done our research. We spent our time on the Google. And everything we've found, all the, 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 the top experts that agree with us, just validate the idea that we are right. And it feels good to be right. It feels so very, very good to be right. Here's the thing you may not understand. Is it the other side of the conversation? They've used the same Google. They've come up with the same kinds of people that will validate their position. They also feel really, really good being right. Now, when two people who are convinced that they're right, two people who are emotionally invested are going to approach each other and try to like, not even even a case of trying to convince each other, just trying to beat the crap out of each other with the idea of you're wrong, you're stupid, you're less than, I'm superior, you're inferior. Where's the productivity in that? Like, holy crap. But this is what's happening. It's happening every day. I see it all over social media. People are just like being jerks. And why? There's got to be a better way. You know, and like that, that comes into like this whole idea of faith versus science. Okay. Like I, I, I can't pretend to ride the fence on this one. I mean, everybody knows I don't place any real value on faith. I'm really, really big on the scientific process. I think it's the most reliable gateway to truth. That being said, there's a lot of people who see the world very, very differently. Now, as impassioned as I can be with this idea that the testable, observable, demonstrable facts are in alignment with, with my positions, I understand that if I'm sitting down to have a conversation who honestly believes that the creator of the universe has communicated directly to them, they don't have any real reason to value the science, just like I don't have any real reason to value value what the holy book says. We're each appealing to our own authorities. Now, we could get into the weeds on whose position is more justified. I don't want to do that here today. But I mean, just whichever side of the spectrum you're coming from, just try to understand that, you know what, there's a reason why these people are holding on so hard to their position. 
Both people feel like they're clinging to reality. They're clinging to truth. They're clinging to the thing that is going to keep their well-being intact. And they see our position that is in opposition to theirs as a threat. By extension, they may see us as a threat. There is a way to minimize this. And it's not going to be by getting aggressive and insulting and hostile. It's going to be about sitting down and having open dialogue. Are we going to change minds? Who knows? We're not going to find out until we start talking to each other like grownups. You know, then there's that whole idea of like, what what does your ideal world look like? What kind of world are you trying to leave for your kids? You know, this is not just well-being for right now. This is well-being for the future of humanity. Again, we have our ideas of how to achieve that. The people that disagree with us, well, they see different ways of achieving that. In most cases, I really do believe that, that they're trying to solve the same problems that we are. It's just they've got different methodology and maybe they see different goals as being important. If we sit down and have discussions about these things, we may realize that, you know, there's a, there's a lot of overlap in their position versus ours. There may actually be room for some compromise, but we're not going to find it when we've dug into this us versus them thing. When we look at them, you're the enemy. No, they're not the enemy. They're your fellow human being. Their well-being isn't any more important or less important than yours. None of us is superior to the other. And if we're going to figure a way out of this whole freaking mess that we've created for ourselves, doesn't it make sense to try to figure out how to get along with everybody, not just the people that agree with us? But the problem is too often we don't see any room for compromise. And when we don't see room for compromise, all the more we just feel justified in, in digging in. And you know, while I'm not a fan of compromise myself, I made that fairly clear on a number of appearances on, on podcasts and whatnot. I do think that if I can't have my way and if you can't have your way, because choosing either of those is going to leave one of us feeling disappointed and put out, maybe there's a third option that appeals to both of us equally that works for everybody involved. If we want to have any chance of finding that, hate to keep beating this point home. We need to talk about it. We need to band together. We're not in opposition. We're all trying to fight for the same thing. Remember this well-being thing. That's what we're all after. Let's find it together. You know, so like what's happening with these conversations? Like when we try to have things, I mean, a lot of you by now are probably thinking, well, I've tried to talk to so-and-so and there's just no getting through to them. Okay, well, maybe you've done a crap job of making your case. I, I I know I'm guilty of that. Sometimes it's like I lead with my passion. You know, if I bring too much passion to the equation, I mean, like, what do you think is happening on the other side? I mean, the other person typically is like on some degree, on some level is going to mirror what we're bringing to the table. If I come in hot, they get on the defensive. Now they're coming in hot, too. Maybe uh, I, I make a bad or maybe, maybe I do a bad job of making my case because I'm coming at somebody with facts, with logic, with with reason. But I'm I'm dealing with somebody who doesn't value any of those things. So my words are wasted. doesn't matter how carefully I've chosen them. I mean, if I'm trying to appeal to an emotional person with logic, they're not going to be any recept- more receptive to that than I'm going to be. If they approach me, who is a logical person from an emotional space, there's got to be a way like, you know, if, if you if you want somebody to understand what you're saying, you can't just shake them until they are receptive. You need to figure out how to speak their language. If it's you who's trying to communicate a point, I would argue that it's your responsibility to figure out how to drive that point home. You're not always going to do that on your own terms. And it's not like you're prostituting your values by figuring out a different way to look at things. I mean, like you've heard Jason and I have so many conversations on the show where we have a bit of a disagreement, or maybe we're not even sure if we've got a disagreement or an agreement. So we'll go to an analogy. Okay. So what you're saying is that like, blah, blah, blah. 
sometimes going to a ridiculous analogy is the easiest way to, to, to gain understanding. Maybe start thinking about that. I mean, just think of all the objections people have when you're trying to make a case and try to think, okay, how could I have handled that differently? How might I approach it, you know, in a way that might be more palatable to them? I think another obstacle to these productive conversations is, you know, we, we set a bad goal for the conversation, you know, especially when it comes into like something where we're debating a hot button topic, we're in it to win it. Now I found more often than not, if I set out to gain an understanding of the other person, they got a weird way of like, yeah, we might go a couple rounds with them maintaining their hostility, but when they see that I am like sincerely in it, just trying to understand where they're coming from, they start trying to see things my way too. Now we're getting somewhere. And more often than not, when my goal is to understand the other person, I do end up winning. They end up seeing things my way. That's what I really wanted. I mean, maybe they don't agree, but at least they understand. And that's all I want. I want to be understood. I want to be heard. I want to be considered. They want that too. Make it easy for them. You know, we all want to be heard. But if you want to be heard, you, you got to get comfortable with listening, man. Like you, you can't just sit there with your fingers in your ears saying, listen to me. And then wondering why they're doing the same thing. I mean, little kids do this. And as adults, when we see them doing that, we think, oh, like stupid kids. We're doing the same thing. And who's stupid here? We know better. They don't. You know, like I said off the top, we have more in common than we have in conflict. So what now? I think over the last half hour, you know, I, I think I've, I, was like, I, I hope I've made a decent case for what now. Instead of thinking that we're dealing with idiots, we're dealing with monsters, we're dealing with people who are just flat out wrong. And I, and I want to take away from the fact that maybe that is the honest case. Not every person you talk to is going to have a mind that you can change. That being said, you never know who's going to overhear this conversation between the two of you. You know, I've often said that I, I don't like engaging in debate in private because I, I know the outcome is most likely my position will remain the same as will my opponents. But if we're both playing to the audience, I think that's where the value is. Maybe people will hear things presented in the way they hadn't considered. Maybe somebody who's riding the fence will end up with a clearer understanding of what's going on. They'll get off the fence and they'll, and they'll pick a side, which is, which is good. You know, if you got a side, you're not so wishy washy. Even, even approaching a conversation, if you've picked the side, you're a lot easier to understand than somebody who's trying to ride it down the middle. And with the, especially with like the, the, the whole social climate surrounding the U S election coming up in November. I mean, like there, there's no room to be on the fence. It's like pick a side, join the conversation and start figuring out with your fellow man how to preserve the well being of, of not just you and the ones you love, but of all of your countrymen. It's important. You know, as a young kid growing up, I mean, I would, I would get so excited seeing an American flag, which as a Canadian kid maybe seems a little bit silly. But when I see that American flag, when I would see the Statue of Liberty, I would always think, wow, what a wonderful place to live. These people that all have joined together under the umbrella of certain values, this, you know, quote unquote, American way of life. I don't know what that looks like to you guys who are listening right now. I don't know how that looks like to the people who disagree with you right now. And maybe I'm a little bit idealistic, but I'd like to think that you guys can get back to the point where the rest of the world looks at you and thinks, wow, America, what a wonderful place to be. Not thinking, God, I'm so happy to not live there right now. Glad I don't have to deal with the stuff they're dealing with. I'm glad I don't have to vote in this election. Just please, for your own sake, for the sake of your well-being, have the conversations, have these difficult conversations. Try to come together. Try to see things the other way. 
Stop with the us versus them. You're not enemies. You all inhabit the, set, this, the same land. There's a way to do this peacefully. I know you can do it. I really, really know you can do it. Anyways, my friends, thank you for putting up with this drastic departure from my normal way of doing things. And until the, the, the next time we talk, I want you to know I love you. I love each and every one of you. I don't want to just use that catchphrase, much love. You matter. Treat each other like you matter. Okay? If you got thoughts on this or anything else I've spoken about, as always, feel free to send me an email in the bloodpod at gmail.com. And if you got the time, please check out my new pod project called uh, Call Me Tony. The details about that are available through my website, acfisher.com. That is A-C-F-I-S-C-H-E-R.com. And yeah, talk to you soon.